start from the beginning. As probably most of you already know, in, in Godot there was quite a limitation, which is that scene processing, namely uh, the process and physics physic process of nodes, could uh, only happen on the main thread. That was making them being processed sequentially and that way you couldn't make, uh, take advantage of multi-core and CPUs, that, that was kind of a bottleneck. So Juan came up with a solution about uh, processing nodes in parallel in groups, but uh, in a way that can be controlled by, by the user, which is kind of similar to, to compute shaders, which is, <laughs> You, uh, yeah, processing a number of items uh, at the same time, and then another batch and uh, another batch. But uh, we'll we'll get into the details now. So that's the thing. Uh, the title well says Godot 4.1 plus because this is a new thing in Godot 4.1, but it's heavily under construction. It uh, in upcoming releases it will be extended, and at some point it will be complete. It's still let's say experimental. But in order to understand what this involves uh, when you need to contribute to a node, because the, the main concern here is that nodes are not exactly written. The, the code of nodes is not exactly written the same way anymore. But in order to understand why, why that's the, the case, let, let's first uh, go over uh, some threading facts. Uh, I will not assume much, uh, but at least, well, if for those of you who maybe don't know, uh, a thread of execution is a flow of execution. You have a, a program, and um, uh, a set of instructions, they are processed. We'll see later that it's not exactly sequentially, but, well, you, you, you get that illusion. They are executed, and, and that's all. The problem is that when you want uh, more than one thing happening at the same time, your program creates additional threads of execution, and that will be fine, except because of the fact that all those threads could be accessing uh, common or shared data, and uh, strange things happen in, in how the, the instructions are, are run. So some some countermeasures had to be put in, into work to, to prevent issues. The, the most basic approach for, in order to, to have a, a thread safe, a, a, well, a program engine or whatever, is, uh, well, just putting a, a, a mutex. Each class has a, a mutex, which is something that uh, prevents, uh, all, uh, that lets only one thread uh, run in that method, and the others have to wait until the, the method finished. Well, this is, this is the, the most common way of doing that in Godot. Uh, oh, you, you will see that uh, on the bottom left corner, uh, I'm putting sometimes uh, paths to some of the source code files in Godot where you can find uh, related, well, stuff related to the to the current slide, but that's just for, for your reference. So, well, in Godot, uh, gener generally, and not only in Godot, but uh, in general, the, the easiest way is each class has has a, a mutex. Therefore, uh, well, each object has a mutex, and uh, only one thread can can do something on that object at, at a time. A big number of elements in Godot follow that approach. But that would be that wouldn't be the the best way of proceeding for parallel processing of nodes, because there would be a lot of uh, lock contention. Uh, you would be threads would be mostly spending much too much time w just just waiting for the locks to be to be released in order to uh, to step in. So we need something closer to logless programming uh, for, for this, this new uh, parallel processing of nodes. But here, uh, it is when 
tricky things start to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the first thing uh, you have to understand is that both the compiler and the CPU, the CPU at runtime, the compiler at compile time, are allowed to reorder the, inst the instructions in your program. So um, things don't work like uh, you assumed anymore. But they at least uh, promise to promise that the observed behavior of your program will be the same as, as if they uh, were, weren't reordering instructions. <coughs> but that is per thread. So if your program has more than one thread, that uh, the observed behavior actually changes. That's the issue. So le uh, let, let's consider, for instance, a, a single-threaded program. Well, single-threaded, trivial situation. Uh, the, the, the compiler and the CPU, even if they are reordering, they are fulfilling that promise, and this is a trivial situation. You, you, you won't see anything weird happening. Things, of course, start to get tricky when uh, more than one thread enters the scene. Let, let's consider uh, this uh, little program in some kind of pseudocode. Uh, let's assume variables are uh, by default initialized to zero. Uh, we have one thread, which does uh, those operations. We have another thread, which does all that. Uh, so uh, we can understand that the first thread is uh, preparing some data and then setting the flag to true as uh, in order to publish that, that data. And the, the, other, the other thread is waiting for the data to be, to be published so it can read it and print it out uh, to screen or whatever. This, this is just all. OK. Uh, well, let's assume uh, this program is being run. Uh, well, both threads start at the same time. And this is, this is run on a single CPU, single core, with no optimizations. The only, the only possible outcome in this scenario is that we get what we, what we expected. Uh, the program prints one and two. A, by the time ready is set to true, and the second thread observes that the ready flag has been set to true, it can just read the expected values from A and B. OK, but usually we are not running stuff on, on single core. Uh, anymore. So uh, let's try now with optimizations. Let's see what are uh, what are the the possible outcomes. Well, we can get one two, we can get one zero, we can get zero two, and we can get zero zero. Yeah. And the, the, in this case. Uh, the difference has been that we have, uh, by enabling optimization, it, it doesn't matter if it's AO1 or, or 2 or 3 It's, uh, I'm in general referring to allowing the compiler to, to do uh, its, to leverage its magic, just to, um, to get the code run faster. So if, if we enable optimizations, the compiler is allowed to reorder the instructions of the program. So uh, the CPU is, even if, this is still a, a single CPU, a single core, uh, because I, I think I, I said it wrong earlier. It, it, we are still in the single CPU, single core case. The CPU would be able to hide the reordering. It, it would be just a, a scheduling threads, uh, a single thread on, on the only core, and uh, giving a bit of time to one of the threads, then a bit of time to the other, scheduled by the OS. In that case, the, the CPU is still a, able to hide their instruction reordering, but the compiler has, has been naughty, so we can potentially get all those results. Uh, something important to bear in mind, I'm, I'm speaking uh, very generally. In certain architectures, inst the instruction reordering done by the CPU is not as heavy. Uh, on 8, 8.86 and 8.x, uh, x86 and x64 
there are uh, some out of the box guarantees about uh, instructions not being reordered in some cases so that's why it's it's a good thing to to test stuff on arm as well because on, on arm you don't have those uh, out of the box uh, guarantees anymore so in general you can you have to assume that if you are uh, working on a cross platform thing or you may be uh, you may want to port to other platforms in the future, you, you have to bear in mind that both the compiler and the G CPU will uh, eventually well, reorder instructions. Uh, now, multi-threaded program, but running this time, yeah, uh, this time indeed on multiple, multiple CPUs, multiple cores. So multiple threads can be really running at the same time. And regardless, the level of optimization, because if we are uh, compiling the program without optimizations, uh, well, the compiler uh, won't be reordering instructions, but the CPU will still do. And if we are compiling with, with optimizations enabled, well, both will be <laughs> doing. So regardless, uh, if, if we are not applying any countermeasure, we can again get any of the four outcomes. Uh, uh, uh. See, lost. Uh, okay, so what what can we do to prevent this without using a, a mutex? That that will a, a mutex uh, would just would just be uh, locking the program so that A and B are are written without thread two uh, being being let run, and then the mutex is uh, relinquished and thread two can then run and and get the values of A and B. But that would be uh, the Loki approach, and that, that's not what we want for, for node processing. So we do a different kind of, uh, well, assigning a value uh, boils down to a machine instruction, which is a store, and reading a value is a machine instruction, which, which is a, a load. So a store and load are our jargon from now on. So instead of writing the program in a way that it does just a regular store, we, we tell it to set the flag with a release. Release, uh, well, store release. I, I, will, I will explain it uh, in a few seconds. And the load, lo uh, reading the ready variable, is load acquired. That's the magic. There are, well, there, there are many, many other uh, kinds of Mm, well, I, I will delve, delve on, on that later. The thing is that th this is the most important thing. All the memory operations prior to a uh, store release, which is uh, what is happening on thread one, can be reordered past that store. So we know for sure that by the time ready is set to true and that's observable by other threads, A and B already contain the right value. And Regarding the load, the load acquire, which is not a regular load, load acquire means that all the memory operations following can be reordered to be prior to the to that uh, load. That means that uh, by the time thread two sees that ready is true, uh, he has no option but reading at that point the values of A and B. No. So both compiler and CPU are forbidden from having read A or N and or B earlier, just for optimization reasons. They are forbidden. So the only, the only thing that can happen is that they are read once ready uh, has been observed to be true. This way, uh, well, it, it said that uh, a load acquire syncs with a store release if they happen on the same memory address. So ready is our, well, our sync variable. The variable, this flag we are using to tell if uh, data is ready, if data is ready to be published, is, is our kind of our sync point. And now regardless, it's single, multiple core, whatever, regardless the level of, of optimization, the only the single possible outcome is what we expected. So, 
how we can get that uh, load, acquire, and store release magic in, in C++? Uh, oh, well, before C++ 11, you could still have those guarantees, but uh, they were not supported by the standard, and you have to resort to volatile, which is not the same, uh, and also add some special directives to, um, which acted as a compiler barriers to, to tell the compiler, well, don't order instructions uh, past this barrier. It, it was uh, cumbersome and no, not portable in general, but thankfully C++11 added, uh, well, uh, STD atomic and uh, some with support for, well, atomic variables, as well as, uh, this is the, the good thing, the possibility to be explicit about which kind of uh, memory ordering you want. So in, in general, and, and this is the, the thing that Godot uses the most, you, you can, well, as long as it's a prim primitive type, type because otherwise, uh, in C++11, if you say, well, I want an atomic variable, so it's uh, read or written all at, at once, if it's a, a long piece of data, it, it will have to, to add a, mut, a mutex or something under the hood. But for primitive, primitive types, uh, it doesn't really matter if it's atomic. It, it, it will be atomic. Uh, it's different from not reordered. But uh, let's, let's uh, ignore for now the, the atomic part. The, the good thing of STD atomic is that you are able to, to tell the, the compiler, I want to store this variable in a release manners. So this becomes a store release. And uh, from other thread, you can do the load acquire. That will, uh, will Im entail that sync magic. So by the, by the time, uh, let's uh, recap on that. By the time the load happens, everything that has been done by other the thread that did the store will be observable. There will be no reordering, so uh, we can keep things under control. But, well, it's easier uh, to say that than, than to make it, but at least now we have the tools. Uh, well, also in, in Godot, where uh, we don't need this kind of uh, logless approach, we are using mutexes and semaphores. But it's, it's important to bear in mind that the mutex and the semaphore also provide a quiet release semantics. But they also prevent one thread from entering uh, that piece of code that you don't want to be, to be run until the other thread is done. So they, they provide a locking or, well, critical section. They, they can have uh, some threads waiting to run. But at the same time, when, when the, the mutex is released or when the semaphore is posted too, so another thread can can jump in, uh, a quiet release has happened on that, on that mutex or semaphore. Uh, I, I would like to recommend a, a couple of resources where you can well, find much uh, more exhaustive and better information on, on logless programming and multithreading in general. Uh, one of them, I, this is I think the more, the best article on, well, SMP uh, stands for, what does it stand for? Uh, uh, well, multiprocessing at least, the M and the P, uh, uh, I think. Well, in, in any case, this article is a very, very, very good and recommended read to understand, uh, to start understanding uh, these things about memory barriers, instruction reordering. Symmetric, okay, thanks. Uh, how how it, uh, it affects, uh, well, the implications uh, across different uh, architectures, a very, very good read. Regardless, it's for Android, uh, most uh, of what you can read there is universal. And uh, Jeff Pressing is quite an expert on these subjects, and his blog is one of the most linked uh, resources 
when people is discussing this kind of stuff. He has a, a number of articles on all these different kind of, kinds of barriers, uh, logless programming, etc. Uh, super recommended. I, I've, uh, this URL is to one of the articles, but uh, then you can just uh, follow the, the thread, no pun intended, and, and read uh, other uh, related articles. So now, back to Godot, how this affects Godot. Uh, 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 uh. Well, as you can imagine, this mm, jump to multi-threaded, logless uh, node processing has a number of implications. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, well, the... This is a, a, a simplified version of how nodes are by default processed in Godot. Its node is processed. Yeah, that's it. Well, there are a process and physics process, but uh, it it doesn't matter for for the for the sake of, of this talk. Uh, it's it, nodes are processed sequentially, one at a time. But now that you can do that, you uh, in every node you have now that a thread group. Th thread group uh, set of properties, you can say, well, I want uh, these this nodes to, to be processed in, well, subthread, to be processed in this uh, parallel multi-threaded fashion. Uh, well, there, there's a very, very good documentation on the properties. You can just hover and, and read uh, what they mean in detail, but the, the key idea is that you can put your nodes in groups and uh, each of those groups will be processed on a thread. So you can have one group of nodes being processed sequentially on a thread, but another group of nodes being processed at the same time on another thread, and so on. So you can, you have now tools to parallelize the, the processing of nodes in your, in your game. So, well, the worker thread pool, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, well, a pool of threads. Uh, Godot uh, on a startup creates uh, as many threads as cores in in your CPU, and you can you can fit work to it, and it, it will put it that work in one of of those threads until they are saturated, and if there are no threads available, the task is put in, in a queue, and as soon as possible, it will be scheduled into one of the threads. So you are not trying to run more, m more pieces of concurrent work as a course your CPU have. That's, uh, that's by design. So that's the thing. As you can imagine, now you can be accessing one node from one thread, and potentially you may want to access that very same node from another thread, because uh, a node may have a reference to that node or may need or want to, to do something with that node. In order to avoid, uh, well, both contribu well, contributors and game developers from shooting themselves on their foot, uh, the same way we, we so far had uh, this Godot is uh, a search, which are the, the error words, I mean, uh, error, fail condition, something is not zero, for instance. <laughs> we now have a, a new set of guards, which are the, the threat guards. All, all these things currently only apply to, to nodes. So that means that, for instance, resources or scripts or some other ways of accessing shared data are not protected by, by now. All that will happen in the future, but uh, so far, nodes, uh, mostly thread-safe nodes is, is what we have now. I, I say mostly because, well, more, more work is needed on that area. Oh, this is an important thing. Uh, when we say that nodes are thread-safe in Godot, we don't mean that they are uh, thread-safe in general as in user scripts can start a thread and, and play with the node and it, it will be fine. No, it, it means that they are thread safe from the perspective of a threaded a node processing. If you uh, play only with the, with the approaches that Godot uh, gives to you, 
it will be fine. Otherwise, it may be, it may not. But uh, the, the guarantee that Godot is providing is about their node processing thing. So the, the basic idea is that uh, during, well, the, the thing will be, will be processed. At some point, we will enter that, uh, that loop. And during that time, where uh, groups of our nodes are scheduled in threads, you can't call methods on nodes that are in other groups. Uh, that's the, the basic premise. And in order to prevent uh, users or the engine from doing so, in case there's a coding mistake or something like that, we have these thread guards. The, uh, they live uh, in, in three groups. The, the current uh, guards we have now, I think they are a bit hard to, to understand. I, I have to, to check my notes to be sure I, I'm saying the, the right thing about them. Probably they, they warrant a, a rename or a way to, to make them uh, easier to, to be understood, but so far this is what we have. So, uh, air thread guard, well, the asterisk means that there's also the air, air thread guard underscore V to return a value if it's in a getter, so that's. Uh, well, air thread guard enforces the basic idea. So if, if you have a, a function on a node that you can't make thread safe, even just for node processing. You just put this kind of guard, and you ensure that only nodes from the same group can, will be allowed to, to run that function. That's like the, the safest bet, but of course that uh, takes functionality away. But in some cases, mm, there's no point in, in allowing certain calls to be to happen within uh, node processing this is the the other kind of threads we the of guards uh, we have this uh, forbids completely completely uh, calling that that function or well the piece of code where where this is even during node processing even if it's uh, within the same group this is just a way of saying you can just uh, I call this function the old way, only from the main thread, only during regu regular node processing. That, uh, this is, for instance, used a lot in control, because control is, is very hard to, to make properly thread safe, because control deals with a lot of shared uh, state in, in the engine, and you generally don't need also to, to be, well, that that kind of performance uh, from, from controls. So the, the most reasonable thing is just to prevent certain calls, certain calls to control from happening uh, from non-main non threads. And finally, we have this kind of awkward uh, read thread guard. This, this one ex exists because of a very specific thing. Uh, so far, we are thinking about kind of isolated nodes. I put some nodes in a group, some others in another group. But what if some of the nodes in a group are uh, descendants of nodes in, a, in another group? And you want to get the global transform. The descendant, by being in another group, wouldn't be able to call through the, the ancestor to know its uh, composite transform. Also, node 2D and node 3D cache uh, transform information. And they need to do some kind of writing. Uh, for those reasons, we needed some, something special and more complex for, for those cases, for node 2D and node 3D. So in, in short, uh, the, well, the read thread guard allows calls from, from from any group. Uh, that the, that's the, the key idea, from any group. So you, from one group, you can be calling a function which is guarded by this kind of guard, even if it's in another group. So you are like crossing a thread boundary. Because of that, uh, node 
2D and no 3D based classes have some trickery to, to allow that uh, in a third safe manner without, uh, again, in a lockless manner as well. So uh, we will see how a node, node uh, 2D approaches this to, in order to allow a cross group or cross thread uh, usage. First, we'll see how uh, set position and get position were before the changes to, to multi-threading. Uh, well, I, I've maybe simplified it a bit, but mostly it, it boils down to that. Uh, yeah, well, set position updates and transform values, which are, which are what I'm referring to as cached uh, transformation values. And then get position takes checks the flag, if the transformation is, is dirty, well, I, I recompute the cache. And, and that's it, okay, very well, but in this multi-threaded context, we can't do just that, just that anymore. So let's see how uh, these functions have changed in order to support uh, group processing. I will uh, <laughs> highlight the differences. Set position now has a thread guard, which means this is only callable from, from the same group. Uh, but the getter, for instance, has the, the special read thread guard. So nodes from other groups can call, uh, can call it on a node which is in, in a different group. But in order to keep things under control, now the trans transform dirty, which uses to be just a boolean, now becomes something different. Uh, we are not just assigning true or false or just uh, checking the flag. We are now using uh, some interesting class in Godot, which is save flag, which is just a wrapper around a std atomic boolean but it's in the, the Godotic approach to uh, an atomic uh, boolean, which provides a quite release semantics. Both uh, in Godot, both a uh, safe flag and safe numeric are coded in a way that they provide a quite release semantics, uh, whatever makes sense. If, for instance, in safe numeric, which is to, to wrap, uh, for instance, integer types, when you increment, Reading the, the current value is a load acquire, and setting the new value, the new incremented value, is a store release. So these classes are, uh, all orbit around acquire release. Godot orbits around acquire release, which is mm, the simplest to understand. In some very few cases, we, we have needed to do, to use different memory ordering. Uh, policies, but acquire release is the easiest to understand, the, the one that makes sense most of the time. So, uh, by using a safe flag, a safe flag for the uh, dirty transform, we are sure that by, by the time, for instance, uh, let's consider the update transform values. By the time set transform dirty runs, and other threads can see that the flag is false because of acquired release, because they are also, uh, is transform dirty, is again, uh, checking, uh, checking the, the flag. So, uh, update transform values is acquire, is store releasing false, and by the time the uh, other thread reads load, acquires it and sees it's false, it knows for sure that all these other rotation, skew, position, scale values contain the current, the current, the right current values. No, the CPU, neither the CPU nor the compiler were allowed to, for instance, a right to position uh, after setting the flag to false, for instance, uh, because of optimization reasons. That optimizations are forbidden, again, because of the, uh, uh, well, the memory barriers that uh, these, these semantics entail. But now, there's a, a question. What if multiple threads, 
multiple node, node groups in the end are running get position at the same time on the same node, wouldn't that be a race condition? If you are not familiar with multi-frame, we call a race condition uh, a kind of bug that happens when you are not really protecting the flows of execution and the outcome depends on how fast one thread runs in relation to, to the other one because of how the OS is scheduling them or because of the CPU or whatever. I, as long as you, you are no longer in control on the, well, the, the pace or the, the scheduling of different threads, you are running into race conditions because, again, the, the outcome is no longer up to you. You are no longer under control. So it seems that in this case, get position has a race condition because uh, when you are, say, uh, let's consider one, one thread uh, sees the transform dirty flag is true. So uh, it enters update transform values. Another thread can still see that the, the flag is true and it enters update transform values as well. So two threads are racing for updating those values. But in this case, that's a, a benign race condition. It's no issue at all because they will be computing exactly the same values. They will be racing for doing exactly the same. The end result doesn't depend at all on <coughs> uh, how they are scheduled. The, the worst thing that can happen is that multiple threads, uh, uh, that a thread doesn't realize that another one is about to update the transform and it assumes it, it has to do it itself. But that's the worst thing that can, that can happen. Both will be writing exactly the same values. And why is that? Because during node group processing, this is very important, the, the transform is not allowed to change. So we, we know for sure that uh, all those threads that are racing for updating the cache values will be seeing the same current transform because set position was forbidden during group processing. Uh, in other words, by the time a, 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 a node is, is running in, well, in these batches of uh, node groups, uh, whatever transform they have will stay. They, they will, whatever transform was set during the regular single threaded uh, old school node processing. So that, that's the thing. The worst that can happen is that multiple uh, threads are doing redundant work. But since the, the original values won't, won't be able to change, they are, they are racing, but they are doing exactly the same. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's get back on track. Well, transform dirty is no longer a plain bull. Now it's a safe flag with, uh, with acquired release semantics. So, Every time you have to update that, that flag, you are calling those set clear is set uh, functions on safe flag, which again have uh, acquired release semantics. And uh, it's worth saying that even though acquired release sounds uh, very lockless, like, well, no, there's no problem. The, the CPU just knows uh, <laughs> what to do, but uh, there's no way, there's no contention, there's no locking. It, they have a cost. The, the CPU has to prevent some things from happening or has to, uh, to flash the, the cache or, or to lock the memory bus. It, it has to do some, <coughs> some stuff in order to give you the, the guarantees of, uh, well, of memory order you know, or whatever. So by using a safe flag now, we are paying that cost, that a synchronization cost, even in the, in the first loop, in the, in the single thread, the main thread loop where for a standard old school classic node processing. Except we don't. Because uh, I, I told a, a little lie. 
it, it's not just a safe flag. It is an empty flag. That, that's an, a union provide, uh, well, in the node-based class, we have the, also an empty numeric, so it can behave both, both as a plain primitive variable and as, as well as a uh, sync aware class because memory, memory wise they bo boil down to the same. I mean, uh, STD atomic for primitive types, at least in <laughs> uh, known architectures, at least architecture known by me, doesn't need to be, to be implemented as something else, uh, uh, storing something else in memory than the value itself. It changes how the operations are done. It uh, issues uh, different CPU uh, opcodes, but in memory, it's still the same. So you can kind of overlap the, the relaxed uh, old school variable with the safe, the thread safe variable. As long as there's some point of sync, uh, which, which happens uh, because of the scheduling, uh, starting the new group, there are ways that the worker third pool has a mutex. You are, you are uh, getting short that what you start there in the, well, the plain way, the, the simple way, will be read by the time you are using it as a safe flag, and, and that's the case, you're, you're fine. So this is what, what is going on. The set transform dirty and is transform dirty are implemented uh, as in the right, not in the left. Depending on if the, the method is being run in the context of threaded group processing, it will, or, or not, it will use uh, one or the other. So we are not paying the cost of synchronization in the non-threaded uh, world, in the uh, standard sequential processing of nodes on the main thread. But this is under construction, as I said, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, especially at, at the code level. The, the general idea, I think, uh, will, will be kept, maybe with some nuances or, or little changes as time goes by, but the, the code may, may change or the, the thread guards may be renamed so they are easier to understand because uh, at least uh, when, whenever I, I hit one of those thread guards, I, I have to stop for a couple of, well, of minutes or for a minute to, to think, uh, what was this guard about? Uh, is this for read only? Is this for uh, group? Uh, I, I don't know. I, so I, I, I believe we need better names. So take it with a grain of salt. Questions and uh, maybe answers. Thank you very much.